Hey, welcome to the cell lab. Um, this one I don't think is super difficult, but there's kind of a lot going on. So I'll try and walk you through it. And there is like a little bit of lecture I have to do. Uh, this happens every semester because it takes us so long to get through chemistry. And the beginning of the semester stuff with mastering and all that madness. Uh, we're usually a little bit behind when we get to the cell lab. So we don't know cells yet, but we have to investigate them in lab. So there will be a little bit of kind of straight up lecture here uh, with PowerPoints and everything. So I finally have everything uploaded. This is that link right there. That is your cell lab. On that page, you can find the link to your lab report. And then in addition to doing a lab report this week, you have an assignment in mastering where you're identifying the different stages of mitosis and that assignment can be found on the lab report or obviously you can just do them both here however you want to do it but if you click here you get this this is your lab report i didn't save it i was just editing it uh, there we go it looks like this this video will show up right here uh, and again I have as I've been doing it materials on one page lab report on the other page I don't know if that's the best way to do it but I don't want too many things on any one page uh, so for this week this is your lab guide if you open it it looks like so I can maybe zoom out on mine a little bit. So you've got your objectives, and those I've also put here, just so that you know how the different objectives are going to be addressed. Now, so if we just look over the objectives, you're going to determine the functions and identify all of your cellular organelles. Um, this is in the lab guide, or I should say everything is covered in the lab guide. Um, you will be working on that in your lab report. Um, and I have also given you this PDF as a study guide, which we'll go over when we get into that. Uh, then you're going to be identifying the different phases of mitosis. Um, this I'm going to show you where to look for that in Practice Anatomy Lab so that you can actually do the studying or the practice in Practice Anatomy Lab before you do your mitosis assignment. Uh, and there is an activity for you to do in the lab report related to mitosis as well. Um, the phases of the cell cycle go with mitosis and that is just information that you need to know. I will point out what you need to know. Um, so it is not, actually it's not really in the lab report, it's just in your lab guide. Uh, and then you are going to learn four different cell types, be able to identify them, say what their structural adaptations are, and then how that helps them perform their function. Um, so we're still working on structure function here. Um, so whether you're talking about a molecule, a cell, a bone, or a muscle, big structure, small structure, um, structures are always adapted to help something perform its function. So we'll go over how all that works. So we'll start with the lab guide, which again was this. And so you are going to want to study this figure and know how to identify all of the organelles that are in this table. Now, the one thing I will point out that we don't do that's actually in your table is, where did it go? I don't even know if I can annotate here. Peroxisomes. Hey, look, I can annotate on a PDF. Don't worry about the peroxisomes. Uh, they are small and round. They look exactly like a lysosome, one of the other organelles there. Um, so we never cover them. And then if it's not in this table, you don't need to worry about it. So what am I looking for here? Vacuole, not in the table. So I'm not going to ask you about vacuole or intermediate filament. Um, so you want to 
study this figure, know the table. Uh, for your lab report, you are going to fill this back out, um, perhaps with some of the functions that I give you, because I'm going to go through and try and explain this in a way that I think is better than the lab report, like actually teach it. Um, so this is what you're doing for that as part of your lab report. And then also what you're going to do, um, depending on how much space you need, take a paper or maybe a big piece of poster board um, or just on a tabletop, make a big circle with string or something to represent the outside of your cell. I don't know why that R is capitalized. Uh, doesn't matter because I'm not going to re-upload it. Uh, then within your big circle that you have drawn um, that is going to represent your cell membrane, you are going to be modeling, as it says here, to the best of your abilities, I know you are not artists, um, each of the different organelles. Um, and with some of them, like there's a whole lot of endoplasmic reticulum in a cell, don't try and make an entire branching network of endoplasmic reticulum because um, you'll drive yourself kind of nuts. Uh, so everything as best you can. Uh, put a little piece of paper or some sort of label next to each of your lovingly crafted organelles, um, and then take a picture of it and insert said picture into this lab report. Um, so I'm assuming most people are just going to do a cell phone picture, and then you can email it to yourself or plug your cell phone right into your computer, or if you're fancy schmancy and everything's in the cloud and you've got like iCloud on your computer, then it's super easy. Um, I'm old school. I still plug my phone in because I don't want to commit to the whole Apple universe. But at any rate, that's what you're doing for your lab report. Now, then let, let me go back up here. I just want to briefly in my own words. Oh, one more thing I should point out. Um, go over this. So on the quiz, you're probably going to see a picture that looks like this. On the exam, you're going to see the model that we would normally use in class. So this is just a PDF of a two-page PowerPoint. Here is the model with all of the organelles labeled. And then on the next page is a key to tell you what all the organelles mean. And I'll just point out that there's A here and there's A here. So this is smooth endoplasmic reticulum and this is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the, again, the lab guide is here. This is that PDF with the picture of the cell model I just showed you and how to get to your lab report. Now, what do we want to know about these derned organelles? And again, I'm going to give you what I want you to know about them. And we're going to start with all of this free-floating stuff over here. Let's talk about mitochondria first. Those are one of our favorites. And I just want to be able to make sure I'm drawing with a relatively thin line. And mito, I think you all can see that. This you want to think of as ATP production. Um, so the book or the lab guide might call it the powerhouse of the cell. Um, it doesn't really produce power. It is a sort of an energy conversion station. You can eat proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, right? all kinds of different sugars and starches and whatnot your body or all these different enzymes that float around in your cytoplasm can convert proteins, lipids, and sugars into some carbohydrate-like molecule, maybe glucose, maybe not, that your mitochondria disassemble. They turn it into CO2 and water, break it all down, and then in the process produce ATP. And then what ATP are is the universal energy currency for 95% of what goes on inside your cell. Um, so the, the way it works or the way to think about it is that 
your cells have packed a lot of complicated machinery into your mitochondria to convert lots of different things into ATP. And then everything else in the cell that needs energy just runs on ATP. So again, it's like having the same battery size for every electronic doodad you have at home. Or now that things are rechargeable, imagine everything had the same plug on it. So whether you're recharging your uh, earbud headphones, your Beats by Dre, your cell phone, wh whatever it is, your drone camera, everything would use the same cord and you would plug it into the wall and you wouldn't ever have to go looking for the cord that you use to charge your Kindle because that's different than the cord for your cell phone. This is what your cells have done, is that everything's just going to run on ATP, and all the complicated stuff takes place in the mitochondria. That was probably too much, but whatever. Uh, let's see, what are we going to do next? Let's look at this little sucker right here. Those are the centrioles. I will not write them down, um, but what you want to know about them, I forget what the... Oh, I'm supposed to be writing, and it won't let me write. Oh, that's because I'm using the wrong end of my pen. You all don't care. There we go. Uh, so the centrioles, we are going to say, organize the microtubules. Tubules. I'm getting better at this. So like this thing here, that's a microtubule. That thing there, that's a microtubule. So then what the heck do these microtubules do? Um, they form basically what you can think of as a scaffolding or a series of conveyor belts, um, and they also form what is called the mitotic spindle. I'll just get that written real quick. Um, oh, and the L is supposed to come before the E there. but So during the regular life of the cell, when it is not dividing, things have to be moved around from one part of the cell to the other. So maybe this little pink lysosome down here needs to move over there. Generally how it happens is that there will be a little protein attached to the outside of that lysosome that'll clamp onto a microtubule and then crawl along the microtubule and drag that little lysosome from point A to point B. Um, so the microtubules provide a little bit of rigidity and structure to the cell, um, help give it its shape, but they're also there to transport things from one part of the cell to the other. When you are going through mitosis, which we will talk about in a few minutes, uh, you have chromosomes are going to be attached to the mitotic spindle, and there are going to be two ends to the spindle. Right? So one end is going to be down here, and the other end is going to be up there, so you're going to have centrioles um, that will migrate to the opposite poles of the cell and organize the microtubules. Um, so we've got, what did we do? We did microtubules, uh, mitochondria, microtubules, centrioles. Let's talk about our little friend here, the lysosome. Now, I'm not going to write that one down. You can just use whatever is in the uh, lab guide, but the lysosome is just this small little blob of membrane that contains within it hydrolytic enzymes. So if you remember from chapter two, hydrolysis is using water to break up bonds so that macromolecules get broken down into their monomers, and that's what happens in lysosomes. Uh, generally, it's when organelles wear out or proteins wear out these broken down parts of the cell get shipped to the lysosome and then the lysosome disassembles whatever gets shipped to it into its constituent parts so broken down into individual amino acids or individual sugars and then those monomers can then be used by the cell to rebuild new proteins or new carbohydrates uh, the peroxisome we said we're not going to worry about uh, let's do, what do we want to do next? I'm going to do this membrane stuff last. So we'll do, um, let's move into the nucleus now. So this whole part right here is the nucleus. 
You'll notice if you look at it, it looks kind of like a big messy piece of spaghetti. Uh, this is supposed to be, if it's a human cell, 46 individual strands of DNA. So 46 chromosomes, because each chromosome is a great big molecule made up of two copies of DNA twisted together. In interphase, which is the period of the cell cycle when the cell is just doing whatever it does, um, growing and metabolizing, the DNA is loosely organized into what we are going to call chromatin. So I want you to say, if I ask you what's in the nucleus, you say chromatin is in the nucleus, and then chromatin is a combination of DNA plus protein, and these proteins are called histones. Uh, so you can think of DNA or your chromosomes as 46 very, very long pieces of thin thread. If you just threw 46 very long pieces of th thin thread into, say, your sewing kit, they would very quickly become disorganized and tangled, and you would probably end up breaking and cutting parts of the thread if you were trying to untangle them. Well, it's the same way with your DNA. Um, so instead of a big, massive tangle of these very long, thin DNA molecules, the DNA is wound around proteins, like thread would be wound around a spool, so that all of the DNA is organized, and this keeps it from getting tangled and breaking, and it also helps the cell manage it. So some parts of the DNA are packed up and wound really tight. Other parts of the DNA are looser, and this affects um, which genes a cell can use and which genes a cell can't. So we are going to say that the nucleus contains chromatin and that chromatin is DNA plus proteins, these proteins being histones. This part right here is the nucleolus. Um, I forget what your lab guide says this is for. I am just going to call it where ribosomes are produced and assembled. Um, so a uh, ribosome, you will learn when we get to the other part of the chapter, um, is what makes your proteins. It is in itself a combination of proteins and RNA. Uh, and because RNA is made in the, nucle in the nucleus from DNA, uh, the ribosomes are assembled in the nucleus and then shipped out through the endomembrane system, all this blue stuff here, um, to your rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so that then brings us to ribosomes. You will notice that there are two different kinds of ribosomes, or they show up in two different places. You have these free-floating ribosomes here, and then... These red dots are ribosomes that are stuck to this blue stuff, which is called endoplasmic reticulum. So first up, we are going to say ribosomes. Those are for protein synthesis. Um, so it doesn't matter whether the ribosome is floating around in the cytoplasm or embedded in the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes synthesize proteins. If a protein is going to just float around in the cytoplasm, then it is going to be manufactured or synthesized by a ribosome that is just floating around in the cytoplasm. If that protein needs to show up in a specific location of the cell, like the protein is going to be part of a mitochondria, or it's going to actually end up in the nucleus, or it's going to be in a peroxisome or a lysosome, um, all of the proteins that end up in a specific organelle or embedded in the membrane or going outside the cell, um, those all get manufactured by the ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So then we get to our rough ER and our Golgi. This is what is referred to as the endomembrane system. Um, and one of the things that you want to understand, and I didn't bring a picture for this, did I? Nope. Um, that if you recall from chapter two, we said that the phospholipids were the major component of your cell membrane. So this membrane right here is a phospholipid bilayer, 
with some other stuff added to it. All of your other membrane-bound organelles, so everything we've talked about except for ribosomes, centrioles, and the microtubules, because those are just collections of proteins, um, but your rough ER, your smooth ER, your Golgi, your lysosome, and your mitochondria are all membrane-bound organelles, so they are collections of proteins all bundled together and held together by a layer of phospholipids, so another phospholipid bilayer. What this means is that um, things can be shipped from one organelle to another organelle in small little bubbles of phospholipid bilayer membranes, little bubbles called vacuoles. Um, and a vacuole can leave, not a vacuole, a vesicle, sorry, a vesicle can leave one organelle and then merge with another organelle, like soap bubbles might combine, because they're all made out of phospholipid. Um, so I just want to explain real quick the difference between um, rough ER and Golgi and how things work. We are going to consider two different kinds of proteins. One protein is going to end up outside the cell either being excreted or attached to the outside of the cell membrane. So if you look at this picture here, I don't know, oh, it's not going to let me draw, right? This right there where I'm circling, that little purple thing is a protein that was made by a ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. That protein is then going to go from the rough endoplasmic reticulum into a little transport vesicle that is going to take it to the Golgi. Um, so the rough ER processes and transports proteins to the Golgi is how we want to think of it. Um, process, transport, but it's sending things to the Golgi, and then the Golgi is going to continue to process the protein. And this might be things like clipping parts of the protein off, and sometimes proteins have uh, carbohydrates attached to them, so there's a lot of modification of the original polypeptide that happens. Some of it happens in the ER, some of it happens in the Golgi. So this particular little purple protein we are following is supposed to end up on the outside of the cell. Maybe it's a receptor of some sort. So there's our purple protein. It works its way through the stacks of the Golgi, and then a little vesicle will bud off of the Golgi. That's going to get moved over to the plasma membrane, probably hitch a ride on a microtubule, and then when this membrane bumps up against the cell membrane, the two phospholipid bilayers, the vesicle phospholipid and the cell membrane phospholipid, merge, and then this protein that was inside of the vesicle is now outside of the cell. Now, this little purple protein here is staying attached to this green protein, but sometimes your cells just fill vesicles with free-floating proteins and dump them outside the cell. Uh, this is how all of your neurotransmitters get released. So they're small polar molecules that get packed into vesicles, and then the vesicles get dumped outside the cell. Let's then assume for a second that our little purple protein friend is supposed to be part of a lysosome. Um, so it is a hydrolytic enzyme. What your Golgi would do is, instead of having it attached to this green thing, the Golgi would just take lots of different copies of that same hydrolytic enzymes and pack up a vesicle with hydrolytic enzymes, and then that vesicle would go, where are we, right? From the Golgi over to a lysosome, and those two vesicles would merge, and you would then dump or deliver more hydrolytic enzymes to this lysosome, or some other sort of enzymes would be delivered to a peroxisome, wherever. The Golgi also transport or processes and transports 
The big difference for the Golgi and what I'm going to write down for it is excretion. All right, so everything that's going to end up outside the cell has to go through the Golgi. Uh, but both the ER, the rough ER, and the Golgi do protein processing and protein transport. Yeah. The rough ER processes proteins, sends them to the Golgi. The Golgi processes proteins and then makes sure they end up either at their proper intracellular location or outside of the cell. It's a little confusing, and the story has even changed since I was in school, so it's gotten even more confusing. Well, not more, but it is now more confusing than it was when I learned it. Sorry. The last thing that we have not covered yet is poor little smooth endoplasmic reticulum that everybody forgets about. Um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum does a lot, actually. If you look at your lab guide, and we just go down to smooth ER, says right there it's involved in lipid synthesis. Um, so this is cholesterol, phospholipids, triglycerides, but mostly think about if you're a cell, you're making phospholipid for your cell membrane. That happens in your smooth ER. Um, if you need to manufacture estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, any of your steroid hormones, those are derived from cholesterol. That's a lipid. All that biochemistry is going to take place inside of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The other major thing we think of smooth ER doing, which is completely unrelated to lipid synthesis, is what the lab guide here calls detoxification. Um, I hate that term because I think people use it to sell you tea and other things that you don't really need. Um, what detoxification means when a physiologist uses it is either deactivating or processing usually metabolic byproducts that can build up and be poisonous to the cell and making them less toxic to the cell or simply modifying metabolic byproducts and sometimes things that you have ingested that you want to get out of the body those get modified in the smooth ER to be very water soluble so that they don't accumulate in your lipids where non-watery things can hide out. Um, and they're also modified in such a way they have little chemical tags placed on them which make them easier to excrete in the kidneys. Um, so it's your liver which does a lot of this work right here preparing things to be excreted from the body by the kidneys. Um, so that's really what detoxification means, and your liver and your kidneys do a good job of it if you mostly just eat healthy and drink enough water, but not you don't have to drink tons of water. Um, if you like your herbal detox tea, then by all means, please buy it. Um, if there's another tea that tastes just as good, but it's cheaper because it doesn't say detox on it, buy the cheaper tea because all of that stuff doesn't really detoxify you. Um, however, if it makes you feel good, do it because it's hard to put a price on feeling good. Um, but yeah, any, actually, really, does any food product that has health claims on the packaging is probably not worth the extra money. Just buy naturally occurring foods. Yeah. I'll stop talking about that. Yeah. There's a whole book about it if you want to called Michael Pollan in Defense of Food. It's very good. I highly recommend it. We will move on. Uh, so that's the smooth ER and the rough ER. Uh, that's enough about that. I think we've gone over everything, right? The nucleus, the plasma membrane, I'm never going to ask you to identify the plasma membrane. Just know it's there. Um, yeah, and we did all that. Um, so that is everything you need to know about the cell. Remembering that the picture that kind of looks like this is probably what's going to show up on your quiz. And then the model that looks like this is what's going to show up on the exam. And you will either identify the organelles or answer functional questions about the organelles that are highlighted. 
So be able, again, to ID them and know what each organelle does. Then we get to too many documents. Um, this part right here, identifying cells and their structural adaptations. This is not in your lab report. So far, your lab report is filling out this table, modeling your organelles out of clay, and then I tell you, don't forget to study this stuff, but I can't think of something for you to do for the goofy lab report. I'm not going to make you make red blood cells out of clay. Um, so you just want to understand what these are. I'll show you the pictures because you might see pictures of these. Um, can't speak. Cell types again. Uh, allow. And also, I should point out, whoa, that went quick. Sorry. Uh, let me go back to that. These little tiny URLs are actually links to something called the virtual microscope. I don't use it a lot because I don't like the images and it's kind of clunky. Um, but the professor who put these documents together really likes it. So if you want to play around with the actual um, more sophisticated virtual, virtual microscope than the one I had you use, you can use these links. Um, but what you need to do is if you see one of these cell types again, be able to identify it should you see it and then know what its structural adaptation is and how that helps it perform its function. So if we just zoom in, let's say here, it's getting a little blurry, but who cares? All, right, all of those little pink dots, those are red blood cells. That thing there, that thing there, and that thing there with the darker purple, those are white blood cells. They are darker because they have a nucleus, and the nucleus stains dark because the DNA is very dense. Now, the red blood cells just stain pink because they do not have a nucleus. Now, so that is the structural adaptation that you want to know, and then not having a nucleus means they can carry more hemoglobin, hemoglobin, right? And the hemoglobin is what oxygen is carried by. So what your red blood cells do is dump their nucleus and all of their other organelles, and they basically convert themselves into little circular bags of hemoglobin so that they can carry oxygen from one part of the body to the other. So that's what you want to do is be able to see that and say red blood cells, no nucleus, more hemoglobin. Over here you have sperm. Uh, these little dark parts, right, that's the nucleus again. Chromatin, colored material. Chromosomes are colored bodies. Um, your DNA is usually dark because it's densely packed. Uh, and basically what sperm are is a nucleus with a propulsion system. Uh, the tails are kind of hard to see. You can maybe see a tail coming off this one. Um, but that is their structural adaptation, is that they have a tail, and the tail is what propels them, right? So these sperm are going to be um, deposited in the vagina, and then they are going to have to swim up through the urogenital mucosa, through the vagina, into the uterus, up a uterine tube, and hopefully find an egg to fertilize. Um, if procreating is the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so that's sperm. Then you have smooth muscle cells. Um, this says right here that they are spindle shaped and nobody really knows what a spindle looks like. I'm going to draw what one of these cells might look like, but it's going to be bigger than it actually would appear here. So there's the nucleus in the middle and then it just gets wider and then thinner and then wider and then thinner. So that's kind of what a spindle looks like. It is a very long, thin cell. So if a very long, thin cell contracts, let's say by 40%, um, you're generating that much movement when this cell contracts. If you have a cell that's already short and squat and it contracts by 40%, then you're only generating that much movement. So the difference between this and this 
is the difference between when a long cell contracts and when a short cell contracts. So all of your muscle fibers tend to be long so that when they contract, they generate more movement. Um, this is squamous epithelial cells. This is what they look like in the lungs, which is not, in my estimation, the best example to use for a squamous epithelial cell. This is basically like taking a dinner plate and then looking at it sideways. So it looks like a frisbee flying through the air. And you want to look at it from the top down so that you can see how much food you can fit on your dinner plate. Um, so I'm going to go back to this goofy little PowerPoint that I put together and say, this is probably what your cheek scrape looked like a little bit last week. Um, this is also a squamous epithelial cell, but now you're looking at it down from the top as opposed to from the side here. And this is how they're arranged in the lungs or how you're viewing them in the lungs. What squamous or flat epithelial cells do is cover surface area. That is the job of epithelia is cover things. So all of the surfaces of your body inside and out, your skin, the lining of your stomach, the lining of all your blood vessels, your genital tract is all lined by different kinds of epithelia. Um, and the squamous epithelia is the most simple, just cover it with a layer of cells kind of epithelia. And if your main job is to cover things, then being flat is the way to do it, right? Each one of these cells here that are squished flat is covering more surface area than these cuboidal shaped cells down here. I will also point out here, because I think it's funny, um, this picture, which I stole violating copyright, don't tell anybody, um, is saying all these little things are mitochondria, but really they're bacteria. So this is what it happens when you don't brush your teeth in the morning and then you do a cheek scrape, is you get all of those little bacterium. Um, but at any rate, be able to, if you see these pictures again, or if I show you a picture of a cheek scrape, because you've seen that, be able to say that's a squamous epithelial cell and it's flat to help it cover more surface area. Uh, what is next? How do I, let me, let's zoom on. So then we get to the cell cycle, which is going to lead us into mitosis. And I have a very similar picture just in here because I wanted to use the PowerPoint to draw on. And um, this is the, the same figure that's in your lecture PowerPoints, so don't worry if you don't have this. Okay, onward and upward to the cell cycle. Uh, th this is how we graphically represent the cell cycle. Uh, so M right here means mitosis, that is when cells divide, one cell becomes two. So right here at this line is when one of the two cells that was developed comes into being as its own cell. Um, if it is a cell that is going to divide again, if it's part of a growth or dividing population, it'll go through what is called G1, um, where the cell is growing and then also doing whatever it is that type of cell is going to do. Um, then at some point that cell will receive a signal that tells it it is going to divide again. The first thing it then does is make new copies of all of its chromosomes. That is S phase. So DNA replication takes place during S phase of, I should say, what we call interphase. Um, I don't know why that's not on here. G, G1, S, and G2 are all part of what is called interphase, which is just the time in between cell divisions. Um, so you go through cell divisions, then you enter interphase G1, you're doing whatever it is that you do, and then you receive a signal of some sort that says, hey, we need more cells just like you. So during S phase, you replicate your DNA. Then you have the second G phase or gap phase, where as it says right here, there's a lot of proofreading that's going on, and preparations taking place in the cytoplasm for the cell to divide. 
Um, if all of that goes well, then it enters mitosis, where you're going to get the division of the cytoplasms and the division of chromosomes. Um, before we get to mitosis, I have a question for you. Um, is there, if I ask you what letter of the alphabet do chromosomes look like, what letter would you say? Many of you might say chromosomes look like the letter X, right? Like we think chromosomes of looking, as looking like something like this or this down here. This is because we only see individual chromosomes during mitosis, right? During interphase, the nucleus looks like that. Um, it is dark but uniform looking. You cannot make out individual chromosomes. This is because they are all loosely coiled or loosely wrapped together. Um, so you can think of interphase DNA as basically like a plate of spaghetti with right long angel hair pasta and lots of meat and sauce. So you can't see where one noodle ends and another noodle begins. When cells enter prophase, when they start to enter mitosis, this is like when you twirl your spaghetti, if you are a good Italian, you twirl your spaghetti on your fork and divide all your noodles up into bite-sized portions on your fork using the spoon or the side of your bowl. Um, this is what your cells do. It condenses your DNA. So we only ever see individual chromosomes like this when the cell is winding up the DNA very tight to make chromosomes that can be sorted during mitosis. Um, so normally, if you could take a cell and trick it into condensing its DNA before it went through S phase, all the chromosomes would look like this little blue thing here. It'd be one half of this X-shaped chromosome. But during interphase, each double-stranded DNA molecule chromosome gets pulled apart, right? and this um, strand of the DNA is going to have an opposite strand synthesized for it, and this other strand of the DNA is going to have an opposite strand synthesized for it. So you're going to end up with here is a new copy of the entire molecule, and here is this other entire new double-stranded copy with all the same bases as the original chromosome. Now two copies of it tied together at a region called the centromere by a structure called the kinetochore. Um, that part we don't care about so much, but we will talk about them. So then when we are looking at this structure here, if you're just looking at the red, ignore the blue, um, that is one chromosome, um, and it has the two sister chromatids. Um, the way they have this organized here with this red chromosome backed up against the blue chromosome only happens when you're making sperm and egg, so it doesn't really belong in mitosis. You don't see homologous chromosomes paired up next to each other during mitosis. Um, that picture I just put there for what reason, I don't know. Uh, so then um, I will go through the phases of mitosis relatively quickly um, and simply tell you what I want you to know about the phases of mitosis. Now, I don't know, I don't remember how detailed the, uh, the descriptions get. These are actually not too detailed, which is nice, because we really want to keep it um, relatively simple. This is not a cell biology class. We're just learning the basics. Um, so interphase, your cell looks like this. Uh, this light blue is your nuclear envelope, and your chromatin is just, or I should say your DNA, is the sh in the shape of chromatin, or the form of chromatin and it is loosely organized, and you can't tell where one strand ends and another strand begins. So the first thing that starts to happen during prophase is, I thought I had all this in here, right? Your DNA starts to condense, so you can actually start to see maybe some individual chromosomes forming, 
it starts to get a little splotchy looking and you might have even some thicker parts of it over here. Um, so your nucleus starts to look like that. Um, then your nuclear envelope starts to degrade. Um, oh, here's the thing that I thought I had. Let me just delete that. And oh, this is this is not going how I thought it was going to go. There we go. Um, so this is early prophase, and then late prophase. Um, basically, your nuclear envelope breaks down and is non-existent and now your chromosomes are getting really condensed so you can start to see more individual chromosomes. And then what's also happening at the same time is your centromeres, I'm going to draw them like this, they also replicate during S phase. Um, so you start with two centromeres and they divide and they start migrating to either side of the poles and that's when you start to get the formation of your mitotic spindles. So they start orienting microtubules to get ready to start sorting these chromosomes here. So for prophase it's just chromosomes condense nuclear envelope breaks down, mitotic spindle starts to form. Then at metaphase, you let me be quick about this one here, one there, one here, one there. You've got all of your chromosomes are going to be lined up along the metaphase plate. Um, and I said in your instructions, think of a cell with just four chromosomes. So I'll do four chromosomes here. This is what your metaphase would look like. And then each one of these chromosomes is going to be connected to both of the ends of the mitotic spindle, and they should all end at the two centrosomes there. So this is what metaphase is going to look like. Um, we still have what we call chromosomes lined up at the metaphase plate. Then in anaphase, and I'm not going to draw the whole uh, spindle again because it gets too, too much to draw. This is when the chromatids separate from each other and we now call them chromosomes again. So they are chromatids when they're together and as soon as they separate they're chromosomes again. And it looks like that because they're being drawn to the poles. Um, so this is what the beginning of anaphase would look like. And then, you know, the end of anaphase, the chromosomes are now pulled closer to the pole. Um, you are not going to see when you look through a microscope or on practice anatomy lab, lots of anaphase because they basically go from the midline to the poles relatively quickly. Um, metaphase you're going to see a lot of because the cell spends a lot of time with the chromosomes roughly lined up in the middle, but it takes a lot of time for all of them to get lined up just right and for all of them to be properly attached to the mitotic spindle. So they stay in this basic formation, getting everything just perfect for an extended period of time. And then once they split, it's just a race to the two poles. So you will not see a lot of metaphase. You'll see different versions of prophase, because that takes a while. Um, but anaphase is the one that you're going to see the least. Um, telophase you do tend to see a lot of also because like prophase, it takes an extended period of time. Um, and you know, it's just very distinct, it jumps out at you. So now in prophase, you've got, I can't draw X's now, this is now individual separated chromosomes have migrated to the poles. Um, so early prophase might look like this. Later in prophase, you might start to see 
the beginning of a, uh, well, you won't actually see this because it's too fine of a structure under the microscope, but the nuclear envelope will start to reform. Uh, then towards the end of telophase, it'll look like the cells are basically separated from one another. Um, and you've got what looks like maybe two prophase nuclei very close to each other. Whoops. Um, uh -oh, I don't know how I did that. I hit a button that I wasn't supposed to hit. No. Still getting used to this drawing pad thing because it's supposed to work like a mouse. There we go. Um, so it looks like kind of like that. And, and this is a very obvious structure. Sometimes you'll even be able to see, as I've drawn here, um, indications of what is left of the mitotic spindle almost kind of pushing the two cells apart. Um, so then there's a process that we have to address that is in your lab guide um, called cytokinesis. Um, it is not a separate phase of... Um, whoops, I'm still doing the drawing. How do I make it stop drawing? There, that's how I make it stop drawing. So cytokinesis starts during anaphase and continues through telophase. Um, and it is the division of the cytoplasm. Right? So you want to remember that there's a lot of stuff in the cytoplasm, right? You've got Golgi, smooth ER, rough ER, all your mitochondria and, and uh, lysosomes and stuff. Uh, and so you don't just draw a line down the middle and say half of the stuff goes this way, half of the stuff goes that way. Um, you have to reform, break down and reform your rough ER, break down and reform your Golgi, and then also carefully um, divvy out your mitochondria and your lysosomes so that your two progeny cells both have roughly the same cytoplasmic contents. Uh, so cytokinesis is going to start during anaphase and continue throughout telophase, and then it'll end when telophase ends. Um, so that is what you need to know, right? For your lab report, what you need to do is this time you're just going to draw mitosis like I drew mitosis with four chromosomes, like I drew four chromosomes, label your four phases, take a picture of it, and plop that into your lab report. Um, or if you want to do what I just did um, and make digital pictures and copy and paste the digital pictures into your lab report, um, whatever it is is easier or more fun for you, however you want to do it. Um, but do try and get everything incorporated into the lab report so you're only uploading one file and I'm only downloading and reading one file. Uh, so we went over all that. Let us get back to, we've got one more thing to talk about. Um, so, right, this is where our lab guide is, our model. Where let's open again. So when you click on the lab report, that takes you to the lab report page. This is where you find your lab report. And then the last thing you need to do is your mitosis assignment. Um, before you do this, you want to study your mitosis a little bit. Um, you can use the images in your lab guide to study, or you can practice in Practice Anatomy Lab. Um, for those of you that are still rusty on how to do that, you go to My Lab and Mastering. I'm going to open it in a separate tab so we can come back to here. Uh, then, whoops, I need to reload you are going to go to or open my lab in mastering when that opens you will want to open your study area and then you will need to launch and then you're going to want practice anatomy lab remember you've got all of this other stuff and there's a video on the home page where i show you this other stuff um, play around with it now and see which, you know, interactive physiology or the animations. 
uh, see what's helpful, practice tests and quizzes. There's just play with this stuff. There's a lot there. Sorry. Practice anatomy lab. You're going to go there. You're going to have to launch practice anatomy lab. Then what you want is histology, because we're looking at microscope pictures and cell division. And can I make that smaller? Oh, no, that's making it bigger. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, well, let's just a uh, holy cow. Uh, what happens if we just reload that? It's still crazy. Uh, all right, it looks something like this. I can't get it all in the figure the way I want it to. So they look like this. If you just mouse over it, the different phases sometimes are labeled, and you can do show labels or hide labels. Um, you can show the gallery, so you can click through and see what you want to work on. You want to do both of these. So these images here, this is onion root tip. Um, so this is the growing part of an onion. Cells just, um, just up from the very tip are going through mitosis, pushing the tip through the ground, and you can find different phases. Um, all of these just amorphous looking cells, this is all interphase. And then here you have two dark nuclei right next to each other. That's probably late telophase. This one right here, they're either going to label late anaphase or early telophase. They're calling it anaphase. Um, and th these two here might also be very late telophase because these two nuclei look darker and splotchier than those nuclei. Um, but you just sort of work your way through practicing things um, and I won't go through all of them. This has got to be a nice prophase right there. They're not saying it, but there's an interphase. There's a clump of chromosomes. So this is interphase chromatin. This is condensed chromosomes. Um, that's definitely a prophase. They're not labeling it. Metaphase, there they're labeling that. Uh, so work your way through. Um, do both the whitefish. So this is the fish embryo. Um, each one of these little blobs is a cell in a growing embryo. Um, at this stage of development, the embryo is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All of the cells look the same. At some point, they'll start developing into different tissues. Um, but work your way through that. Whoops. Again, you can turn the labels on. You can turn the labels off. Practice trying to identify the different uh, mitotic figures. Then you can give yourself a quiz or a practical, which is just the same stuff but longer than the quiz. Then once you're confident that you can identify the different phases of mitosis in both the onion root tip and the fish embryo, the whitefish, whitefish blastula, then you come back here, you click on that, and it will take you to a five question quiz one question for each phase um, to see that you have reviewed mitosis. And this is going to be in mastering, but again, you can access it through Canvas. Uh, so that that's everything, right? We've covered the cell lab and the lab report. Remember that you are submitting on, whoops, if I click there, on the lab report page um, and then when you click here it'll take you out to mastering that you don't have to submit you just do it and then it ends up in your grade book both of these are due by saturday try and do it before saturday so that i don't check my email on sunday morning and find somebody has emailed me at 11 o'clock the night before because they couldn't figure it out um, so that's it. I'm going to shut my mouth and stop. Good luck. Let me know if you have questions.